Welcome to the Healing Grove Podcast. I'm Dr. Kristen Ryman, an integrative holistic family physician, author of Life After Lyme, and host in this virtual space of learning, healing, and growing. I believe humans are like trees, and our physical limb is only one of many. Health on all limbs of the tree, emotional, conceptual, social, spiritual, is absolutely required for the whole tree that is you to be vibrantly well. I created the Healing Growth Podcast as a place to showcase some of the world's best integrative and holistic medicine, to expose you to transformative tools and mindset shifts for all limbs of your tree. I hope you enjoy our conversation in the Healing Grove today as much as I enjoyed having it. Hi, everyone. Welcome, Dr. Klinghart. Hi, Kristen. Good morning. It's so great to have you on the Healing Grove podcast. And I just want to say from the start, I'm just so grateful for your time and your experience, not just for this podcast, but over the many, many years that you've been my teacher in person and from afar. So thank you. I want us to do this. Thank you. So everyone, meet Dr. Dietrich Klinghart. He is one of my most important teachers in the Lyme and mystery illness space, which is mostly the space you know I inhabit now. And I'm going to give a little bio for him and then let him tell his story. So Dr. Klinghart studied medicine and psychology in Freiburg, Germany, completing his PhD on the involvement of the autonomic nervous system in autoimmune disorders. Early in his career, he became interested in the sequelae of chronic toxicity, notably lead, mercury, environmental pollutants, and electromagnetic fields, or EMFs, for the course of illness. While working in India, he encountered Eastern concepts of disease etiology and blended them with his Western training. This laid the foundation for his five-level system of integrative medicine, which we're going to get a little bit into in this conversation, I hope. In the U.S., he spent three years as a full-time emergency medicine physician before becoming the medical director of the Santa Fe Pain Center, where he was for several years. Increasingly aware of the limitations of conventional medicine when dealing with chronic conditions, he trained in Ericksonian hypnotherapy and began to include body-oriented psychotherapeutic and counseling approaches in his work, along with neurotherapy, mesotherapy, injection techniques, and applied psychoneurobiology. Dr. Klinghurt has contributed significantly to the understanding of metal toxicity and its connection with chronic infections, illness, and pain. He's been instrumental in advancing various fields within biological medicine, non-invasive pain management, injection techniques for pain and orthopedic dysfunction, anti-aging medicine, toxicology, pediatrics, including neurodevelopmental disorders, which are so prevalent and continue to rise, energy psychology, biological dentistry, and more. He's also developed a special technique called autonomic response testing, which is a comprehensive diagnostic system that has helped many practitioners become accomplished holistic physicians. And that's actually where I first met you at an ART training back in 2013. Dr. Klinghart founded the Sophia Health Institute in 2012, where he's still actively involved in patient care, as well as the Klinghart Institute in 2008, from which he teaches internationally. So there's so much more I could say. That bio seems like just the pared down version of all your accomplishments, but we'll start there. And I would love to invite you to tell us your story of how you entered this world of holistic, integrative, complex care medicine. Yeah, so, I mean, there's there's many angles to it, but so the the short version is that uh, in medical school, while I went to medical school in Freiburg, uh, there was no division yet in Germany between alternative medicine and medicine. It was all one thing. So we had obligatory courses in herbal medicine. We had a whole foundational course in homeopathy and acupuncture. And I thought that was that was what medicine was. And so when I uh, did my surgical residency, I uh, we were all asked to use our knowledge use acupuncture on the post-surgical patients and homeopathy and some manual techniques. And um, it led me to study with a wonderful uh, physician in England, James Suriags, uh, who had developed a whole system of what was called at the time orthopedic medicine versus orthopedic surgery. That means that uh, non-invasive techniques to treat uh, chronic pain and chronic orthopedic conditions. And that was really my 
my main experience. And then I lived a few years in India and actually worked in a very, very busy uh, hospital there and um, learned, you know, down the street was Dr. Vasant Laz, like a today famous Ayurvedic doctor in the U.S. And um, there were, we were surrounded by the, uh, you know, the established medicine in India, which was relying at the time very, very heavy on homeopathy and Ayurvedic medicine. And so we got a good taste of that. And then with all that under my, <laughs> under my belt, I came to the U.S. Um, I really didn't mean to stay here. I just meant to have a year off. Went to Hawaii and met an osteopathic physician who introduced me to American medicine and through his name is James Baum, who was a wonderful healer and gifted physician. And he uh, moved back from there to Santa Fe and took me with him. And so that's when we together established the Santa Fe Pain Center, which was at the time, the second largest pain clinic in the U.S. And then, um, so, of course, by treating pain, uh, we encountered patients with cancer and encountered young people with pain. And then, of course, you know, if you have one family member <laughs> and they think you're a hero, then they're bringing the other family members in with other conditions. And so, it quickly branched out and so into uh, what I'm doing today, you know, which is really uh, treating chronic illness on all on all levels, and the yeah the unique thing I'm like to mention a few times is that um, when we look at the causes of chronic illness, um, unfortunately, right now, medicine or most medical doctors uh, believes that the reality that's created by doing lab work and imaging techniques kept us the whole of reality. The truth is, there's many phenomena, like how do you measure the influence of your Wi-Fi router on your cells in the body? There, there is no lab test for that. You can follow the lab test over time, and the patient is getting worse and worse, but you cannot make the diagnosis electrosensitivity based on lab work. Uh, you have to actually have other forms of testing. But the same uh, applies, for example, we still in medicine do not have a single test that can show how much mercury you have in the brain. Um, the only studies that can show that are post-mortem studies. And so I call my method as autonomic response testing a pre-mortem diagnostic tool yeah, where we can actually measure the amount of mercury in your brain and a specific part of the brain while you're still alive and that required a whole different approach to diagnostic testing. The same was true in the early days of Lyme disease and the labs were still um, struggling with detecting it. It hasn't has improved, but it has not totally changed. We still sort of right now, I would dare to say the detection rate of chronic Lyme is still fairly low. There's still 20% or so missing, which seemed to be the 20% that come to my office. Um, and so we needed a different diagnostic tool, and when I developed that, there's a mix of what looks like applied kinesiology based on manual and muscle testing, and um, but it follows certain rules that I found absolutely incredibly important. Remember, I did my thesis on studying the autonomic nervous system and how it's involved with everything. And so, and of course, the the main influence on the strength change in muscle when you do manual muscle testing is the autonomic nervous system. If it goes in a stress state, your muscle tone changes and you can detect that. And so, based on that, so we discovered first, you know, in America, most people are metatoxic. They have chronic illness. Most people are toxic with glyphosate. Um, most people are toxic with um, fluoride and aluminum recently in the last 20 years. And based on the toxicity, uh, the toxic terrain allows pathogens to grow in us that otherwise would not grow. For example, we know that there's a synergy between aluminum toxicity 
and the viciousness of Lyme disease. It's a direct relationship. And you cannot treat chronic Lyme without bringing down the aluminum as well. And so these are simple equations, but it's very, very hard to find an audience for that. Um, I'd rather have people, or you know, people rather make other choices. Then there is no diagnostic tool that can show how much aluminum you have in the brain. Uh, most of my colleagues ignore the issue. If you can lab test it, it doesn't exist. And so, through working in, by including looking at things that nobody else looks at, we found that many of my patients, when they come to me first, they have a lot full of parasites. I know mold toxicity, thanks to Richie Shoemaker's work, mold toxicity is now very well known um, that people have biotoxin illness from the toxins created by mold. But there, there is a question that remains. Uh, again, mold has been found because there is lab tests that can be done to show it. But why is the mold in some people um, so illness-producing and others not? And Klinghardt tests, based also on the literature that's available, that molds store a multiple of their own body weight of toxic metals in their coat that they're actually extracting out of the environment where they live in the fascia and the muscles and the blood. They're extracting toxic metals and buying them into their coat. That has an advantage to the host that sort of temporarily detoxes the host, but has an advantage for the mold also because it fortifies it against the immune system. And then the tragic thing happens. If you try to kill the mold, it releases toxic metals on the system. And this is, you know, people call it the die-off effect and the summer reaction, but it's not. It's simple, the sudden occurring uh, toxicity. And so, again, since there is no decent lab work, you can show that, you know, with the blood test on lead levels and maybe mercury levels if you test the patient during a crisis. But since there is no decent lab work for the underlying issues, people don't know that. And so, just as an example, so when you treat mold with agents that may kill the molds, like, you know, itraconazole or fluconazole, um, you have to anticipate that the patient will have a huge release of toxic metals. And you give some GMSA or some binder steel trovella with it, and that will be the, the solution you know, to elegantly move through that phase. Yeah. And so... Yeah, listen. Yeah, so, yeah, so I, I want to highlight that piece about the yeast carrying mold in their membrane or in their coat. I remember learning that from you a decade ago and just kind of a lot of light bulbs went off for me. Um, it really does speak to the issue of when the terrain is toxic, the bugs will move in to help kind of buffer that for the human host. And yet they're still in there and they're still full of those poisons. So they need to be kind of mitigated when you take them down. Um, I think there probably are some people on this call who are listening and wondering still more about ART. Like that sounds like kind of the perfect test, the pre-mortem diagnostic test for all these things that actual testing doesn't exist for yet. Um, can you maybe simplify for people who, for whom they've never maybe even heard of muscle testing? I think for me, it, a light bulb went off when I sort of learned about it with you and was thinking about the, the sort of similarities between like the lie detector test, which most people can have you know, have some kind of ex experience of or hearing about at least. And then what happens in an autonomic test? You mentioned the muscle gets strong or the muscle goes weak when there's stress or not stress. But maybe just walk us through a little bit more so people can imagine if they came to see you as a patient, what that might look like. Yeah, so the, um, the, the principle behind it is this, like, for example, if somebody is wheat allergic or gluten allergic, and I place a little bit of wheat or gluten on that tongue. There's a signal that goes to the brain, to the vagus nerve, and it creates an autonomic nervous system response. The heart rate accelerates, and the, the vagal activity decreases. And that can be measured today, you know, that heart rate variability, or simply by counting the pulse. And this stress reaction doesn't just affect the cardiovascular system, like heart rate, 
but it also affects the muscle tone. And the muscle tone can be checked with the Goraiji of technique. And so basically, when you come to my office, yes, I do a physical exam, you look at your lab work, and then you lie on the table, and then I assess the muscle tone of several of your main muscle groups, and then we do some prior testing. For example, uh, I may place some toxic substance near the patient and see if the patient uh, responds with the stress response or not. And if the patient does not respond with a stress response to a toxic sus uh, substance, we call that blocked regulation. I mean, if the patient is unable, it's so toxic, the patient is not unable to discern and their fear what's toxic, what's good for them, or what's bad for them. So we, we have then certain steps to lead, lead through that. And so, and then um, one of the, uh, the major unique things about ART testing yeah, ART stands for Autonomic Response Testing. The, one of the main influences on that is the work of the genius uh, Yoshiaki Omura, a physician in New York, who um, developed a whole host of peer-reviewed literature when using one particular form of manual muscle testing called the Bi-Digital O-Ring Test. And one of the principles there is it's very simple. It's a direct resonance phenomenon. That means, for example, I can take a vial and have a certain concentration of mercury in it and hold it near certain parts of your brain. And where, when it changes the muscle tone, when this simple movement, this proximity changes the muscle tone, there's a resonance between the concentration of mercury in my vial and the concentration of mercury in the brain. And this is how we can find mercury in the brain. And not only that, but also the concentration of it in a particular tissue. And that sort of has been a revolutionary approach. You know, we can find the spike protein in the liver. We can find the spike protein in the heart. We can find vaccine residues in your brain and your thyroid and your kidneys. And um, especially during the COVID time, that this tool has been incredible, you know, that we basically had a effective treatment modalities already in January 2020, where we could um, save a lot of lives because we, with this testing, we had very quickly found out um, which medications and which herbs and which approaches uh, will antidote uh, the effect of the infection that people had. So I think that's all I want to say about ART. There is online training on that, thing at institute.com, and you can take the online courses um, if you're interested in, or which would be my preference, those of you who are um, still suffering or, or not sure about the state of your health, come to the Sophia Health Institute, uh, where I'm surrounded myself with a number of well-trained uh, ART-capable physicians. And we use our diagnostic procedure to take you through the drill, so to say, where we look for what we call the five levels of healing. Um, we may get into that in a moment, but we basically look for uh, the chronic infection that you may have, the Lyme disease, the Epstein-Barr, the cytomegaly, the fungal infections, and for parasites. Parasites are huge, but there is no lab test in the U.S. that you can rely on. Yeah, if you have a positive lab test um, in the poop, that means the parasites were in your poop. Well, the most critical ones are not in your poop. And then you can do a saliva test looking for the DNA, but it may not be in the saliva. And so you're stuck, you know, sort of if you want to make the diagnosis of chronic parasite dependent on the lab test, you're out of luck. And so we're looking for parasite, we're looking for mold on this level, and we look for a whole host of toxins. That's sort of the physical level stuff. And then there's a level above that, the five levels of healing model. Um, that's the energy body. You know, these are all the forces of physics that are working on, our, on us and in us. 
And the main important influence here is the Wi-Fi environment, yeah, which has billions of times increased just in the last 20 years. And we know that um, the radio waves, when they go through, uh, have a significant biological effect on the cell, basically causing oxidative stress, causing the, the creation of peroxide nitride, which is a very lethal uh, oxidative substance created in the cells and many other forms of damage. And so, and when you're exposed to that, you're not the same person as when you're not exposed to that. And exposure over time, if it's 24-7, will have huge biological impact on you, including creating breaks in the DNA, which only were thought to, to be caused by uh, radioactivity and, and X-ray. But as it turns out, even the non-ionizing uh, wavelengths of radio waves can do that. And so um, autism, uh, for me, after all these years, is more and more linked to the exposure of the mother during the pregnancy to radio waves. Yes, the mole plays a role and other things play a role, but the radio wave exposure is a big elephant in the living room that none of you want to talk about. And so I knew. <laughs> and so, and because we don't have a lab test for it, but we do have ART testing that will clearly, clearly show that in pretty much everybody alive now. And so we make an attempt when we accompany pregnancies that we protect moms uh, from the rate of age as much as possible. And then, you know, there's a level above that which we call the mental body. This is the level of where well, all our learning and all our traumatic experiences from conception until now are recorded and have an influence on our health. Um, this is sort of largely the realm of psychology, but also the realm of classic homeopathy. Both work on the same level. And so we do in my office in the Sophia Attention, we have a whole practitioner dedicated to work just with that level at Stemming the Strange. Uh, she is a very, very gifted uh, healer on this level and so on. It's a huge issue for everybody with chronic illness. You know, the more we can unburden the system of the different things, the more um, likely the person will snap back in health. And then above that is the level that in psychology is called transpersonal psychology. It's the level with all the weird things, you know, the past lives and the vivid possession and the, the, the demon and the curses and the negative thoughts, fears to um, reach people and can cause illness. And that's the level we're exploring with the family constellation work, which is a wonderful technique that's done in a group, in small groups, where people sit in a circle and then one person after another uh, gets to work and they'll work. And we uh, me, offer that to the families with autistic children um, and had some fantastic, wonderful, magical feelings on that level. And this is the fourth level, and then there's the fifth level above that. It's basically your connection with the divine, which I feel should be left private to the patient, intimate uh, to the patient and God and their connection. And no healer has any job to do here um, that's trespassing into a sacred space. And so, so this idea of these levels is not my idea. It comes from Patanjali. He was the guru, basically, who created yoga uh, over 5,000 years ago. And this, his first writings is on the five bodies, uh, which are addressed in, in this way. And so we adopted that system and made it into a clear-cut medical thing. So on the first level, we do what all of you do. We do a functional medicine, but we measure it, so to say, in toxicity and chronic infections. On the second level, we use acupuncture, neural therapy, magnetic fields, light therapy, sound therapy. We use all the tools that have to do with electromagnetic energy. 
want of gravity, but also a strong force and weak force. So we have a wonderful set of tools on this level, which are clearly different from the tools on the first level. On the third level, we, I developed a technique based on my psychological background and understanding called mental field therapy, um, which is a very targeted technique that uses again the manual muscle testing as a biofeedback method to go deep with the patient. Yeah, it's a mix of hypnotherapy and biofeedback psychotherapy. And then on the fourth level, I mentioned it already. In general, we use family constellation work, but they also work with a number of a carefully vented, vetted and uh, tested and chosen um, healers uh, all around the world that help uh, uh, on the, our patients on that level. That's that's sort of like our basic system. And at the Sophia Health Institute, we integrated all that into one one thing where all the practitioners know uh, follow the same uh, the same principles. So it's a very um, it's a more complete system of healing than in uh, most other systems that I know. I mean, I wouldn't teach this one and lift this one if I wouldn't think it's the best system, but there may be other systems that offer like a similar comprehensive approach. Yeah, I, you're, you're a humble person, so I'm just going to say it's the most comprehensive thing I've ever learned around healing and di- both diagnosis and treatment and um self-discovery. It's it's a beautiful and beautifully elegant system. I want to um, point out or maybe even check myself on this belief because I feel like I learned this in one of your teachings and trainings that anything on the higher levels, like you can clean up the bottom, you can do functional medicine as much as you want, as much supplements and as much detox. But if you're not dealing with and addressing the things at the higher levels, they're going to continue to kind of rain down and recreate the physical issues. Did I remember that correctly? Yeah. This is actually in a uh, philosophy which is called downward causation. You know, so look, let's say you have a unresolved family trauma. This would be a transpersonal issue, something that's not out of your own life, but let's say you had a you had a dad who was in Vietnam who came back highly traumatized and, you know, was was abused. But maybe in in Vietnam he maybe he had a child with somebody there that then, you know, he didn't know. And so the child grew up in poverty. And this is what's called a systemic effect, um, that the suffering of the child will express itself, also will be found in the life of the upbring of this soldier after he returned home, married a happy American woman, and sort of now they have two children, and one of her children she has abandoned and she is lonely all their life. And nobody has an explanation for that. Right? So this is like, and the, of course, the loneliness of the child is a third level issue. And loneliness, we know, create uh, problems in the small intestine. This is a, we know these uh, things from acupuncture. Loneliness is a hallmark of people that get SIBO, that get uh, leaky gut, they get parasites, they get uh, they have a weakness in the small intestine area, which is now, um, you know, but it's the first level issue of the parasite, our first level issue in cerebral, fourth level events that happened that wasn't healed, that trickles down, you know, and affect one of the family members who call it, uh, you know, psychological issues that look like loneliness or feeling abandoned uh, that expresses itself then actually in terms of compromising the autonomic nervous system innovation of the small intestine, which is a second level issue, and that trickles down and then manifests itself as a leaky gut. And we can do the zononine test or, or parasites you know, that you can detect um, when you do appropriate treatment. So this is called downward causation and so on up that um, most symptoms are on the first level, the cancer and third level, most symptoms are on the physical level. 
chronic pain, numbness, chronic fatigue, blurriness of vision, uh, sore throats, and all physical level things. But the cause of that is more likely be on the first level, the second level, third level, or fourth level. It could be any uh, on any level where the true causes of it. And so, and the, the thing is, you know, if you work on the first level, let's say you have a leaky gut and you're treated, say, with ketotifin, uh, you're treated for six months and you think you're done and the moment you stop at the treatment, it comes back, um, then you know it's probably not a first level issue and you have to go a level higher. And then you're treated, let's say, with acupuncture or neurotherapy on the electromagnetic waves and Again, the patient gets better, but the moment you stop, it comes back. You know, I had to go a level higher. There must be some psychological reasons to clean up the psychology. And then, uh, again, you get temporary improvements, but it keeps coming back. Coming back. Well, most likely, uh, the original or the real cause of it is higher up. And the beautiful thing is the moment you address the issue on the level there was the true origin of it, which often is on the third and fourth level. When you address it there, boom, the symptom clears up and it never comes back. And that was uh, the most, for the patient, the most effective way of working. For the physician, it's the least attractive <laughs> financial thing because you know, when you actually meet somebody and they get well, you get nice Christmas cards and birthday cards, but you no longer make any money with that patient to recon patient visits or treatment in your office. And so there is a seduction in our field for the physicians to not learn the techniques and procedures on the higher levels, but to stay confined the first level, maybe a little bit second level, that the patient needs to come in for treatment over and over and over for the rest of their life. This, I just like to point this here, not that people consciously make those choices, but unconsciously we all um, all have our price. We all can be bribed. We all can be um, coerced in a certain direction to not, to ignore, willfully ignore certain aspects of reality uh, where there is no money to be made, you know, and then and, and to focus more and more on the aspects, you know, so this has sort of become like a naturopathic medicine, you know, the blossoming of the IV therapies, you know, IV therapies are fantastic and patient feels immediately better afterwards, but only for four or five days, maybe a week, and then they need to come back and to come back and that patient integrates it into their lifestyle that, you know, four times a month, for the rest of their life, they go get their nutritional IV with their local physician, um, and it becomes a business that mutually people benefit from. But the higher level would be to figure out why does the patient need this particular set of vitamins, things. Um, is it really the primary need, or is the need caused by something higher? that's happened in the past or in the future. And um, do they, would the patient not be more fulfilled if they find a true cause of it and to solve that and get their life back in, in order in other ways as well? Yeah, that's a really, yeah, it's a really important point. And I, as I think about the different healers and doctors I know who, do some of this work, I think part of it is just access to tools and understanding, right? Even if you have sort of the construct of five levels or something similar to it, and you understand there are these different influences, everyone has their own box of tools, right? Everyone has what they've learned and, and sought out and maybe had to learn for themselves. I mean, that certainly describes me. Um, and I, um, I know that there are also people who are very, very good at ART, your autonomic response testing technique, who are frankly uncomfortable in some of the different levels. And I see I see everyone has blind spots, is, I guess is what I'm saying. You know, like everyone sort of optimizes the tools that they're most comfortable with. 
I wonder if you'd talk to us a little bit about um, toning and tapping, because you said something to me once at a conference. I asked you, you know, if toning and tapping, which I hope you're going to share with us um, a little bit about, is so effective. Why is it that enough? Like, why isn't that enough? And you said to me, you know, I've been doing a 30 year experiment comparing the Europeans who don't want to take all the supplements and really do want to do sort of this higher level work that they can do on their own for the for cheap and free and you know daily compared to the Americans who don't want to do the higher level work and want to take the supplements and i said well who's you know who's winning and you said hands down the europeans are winning this now, so so first a, a few words about the consensus reality you know the reality that we all believe in is true that comes to us through the computer through the television networks through the uh, communication we have with friends and relatives and through the newspapers. And uh, because of what I just said, the guy in the finances, the main money in medicine level, that means giving nutrients, giving medications, giving pills, giving injection. That's all first level stuff. That's where all the money is made. And 99% of the medical literature is uh, dedicated to those areas of medicine where money is. You know, that, that the 1% maybe uh, that's left that addresses the psychology or the energy medicine or even the higher levels is virtually absent in the more medical literature that has created the false image that real medicine is giving, finding the best vitamin <laughs> that the patient needs. That's real medicine. All this armor is kind of woo-woo. But it's uh, how consensus reality is created, you know, through the media that uh, has already emphasized one level or neglected other levels. And so tap and tone is a technique that, of course, is, is not really my technique, but I, um, in the, God Ben was it, in the 80s, I worked with, with good heart, you know, to learn the principles of muscle testing. And in one of my my workshops, I we always would pair up with another person. I got paired up with, um, uh, with a very, very gifted um, uh, psychologist. His name was Roger Callahan. Uh, and Callahan um, was um, developed later on a technique called TFT based on what we've learned. But we basically barring with each other overlaying almost the whole week. And uh, Callahan had, uh, he was very well published as a psychoanalyst, you know, so he had written dozens of paper and had written books on uh, different psychological techniques. And uh, Callahan had suffered his whole life uh, from homophobia. I don't want to disclose the details here, Callahan is not deceased, but he had a phobia and so, and really, I tested him, and so he was testing on one particular set of meridians that went under stress when he, when he thought of the situation that is worse for his phobia. So, and there was the spleen, stomach, meridian, system. and so we just had learned how to tap the end point of those meridians, and so I tapped... Uh, the, the end point of the stomach meridian on the foot and the end point of the speed meridian has on the big toe and then um, some points halfway and his phobia disappeared. It didn't just disappear, it disappeared forever. So I'm not taking credit for that. I was in the teaching and I meant there. And then uh, Canahan immediately afterwards wrote a new book. There was a best seller at the time was called the Five Minute Phobia Cure. Um, by using tapping of certain acupuncture point um, while, well, while you're exposing yourself to the phobic object. And so there was the beginning of these tapping techniques. You know? So it comes really from good heart, and then uh, Callahan was the one who kind of nailed it in the first book written on it later on. Um, now, and I was there from the very beginning and kind of was fascinated by that, and of course took that in my own way uh, into my office um, to to work with tapping or acupuncture points and 
um, in context with psychological issues. And so Callahan went on and developed a system called blood field therapy and then tried to trademark that and couldn't because there were already, the students were already using it and some student had trademarked his name so he couldn't trademark his own technique, so he called it Callahan Techniques. And it's still the most advanced school of the tapping techniques, let's put it that way. And so I went a different way with that uh, based on the work I'd done with and my thesis. I realized or remembered that the uh, vocal cords are innervated by a branch of the vagus nerve. And when you actually own toning it, open mouth, making a sound, continuous sound. When you do that, I did that during my thesis, we measured that, you know, sort of, and when you tone, you usually activate the parasympathetic nervous system. And so, basically, it's like this, when you kind of think of a childhood trauma, your parasympathetic nervous system goes down, your sympathetic go up, you go into a stress response that covers inside you, with the memory, the visuals and the sounds that you remember, it is automatically. And so when you actually at this point tap, you bring him down to the sympathetic palm. That's what tapping these acupuncture points that are carefully selected does. It brings the sympathetics down and the toning brings the parasympathetics up. And if you can maintain that for 33 seconds or longer, the conditions Conditioned response is forever broke. That means you can think of the traumatic event without getting the arousal of the sympathetic nervous system. That's a huge part of healing on a very simple physiological level that is unfortunately ignored by the medical community or by the community psychologically oriented the schools of thought. Um, and so it was moved into the alternative field and so under the name EFT and T, TFF and MTFF, whatever. There's like a hundred techniques now that use elements of that um, for for treatment. And so they're all good. But most of them are missing the toning. are missing the toning and most of them are missing the, the final things, you know, so there's a different whether you tap in a waltz rhythm or a blues rhythm. And there's a difference whether you're tapping strong or tapping lightly. There's a difference in uh, tapping the exact points or missing them by an inch or two. And so I developed a, a technique called MFT, mental fear therapy, where we teach the exact way of doing this right and this worldwide. I don't know, it's a couple of thousand people that are using it. And the feedback is fantastic, you know, from the results. So it's part of our treatment modality. It's not the whole thing, but it's an important part of it that largely has to do with trauma uh, in this lifetime. And also, largely so has become our main trauma therapy. Patient makes a, as homework makes a list of all traumatic events in their life. And then one by one, we go through it and do tap and tone on them before uh, until there's no more impact on it. And that works absolutely beautiful. And like I said, in my office at Debbie, Dr. Debbie, who is doing mostly just this work. Mm, beautiful. Um, how would you say the MFT and the, the tapping and toning overlaps or replaces or, or is, is synergistic with some of the, you know, limbic training, limbic retraining programs out there that are doing as many of the same things? Like, what what would you say the connection is between those two things? Well, there's, uh, of course, many different ways of skinning the cat. Um, I think my my method is the closest to um, the understanding of modern physiology, uh, cutting out a lot of the mysticism and a lot of the um, things that you have to do with your mind uh, based on a very, very, your physiology and physiological response. And it's a very direct way to resolve trauma. It takes 33 seconds, you know, sort of where the limbic retraining or so, there's a 
weeks and months of, of counseling on of doing inner work, doing the, the, the inner techniques, you know, sort of that are more lengthy. The, the good, the good, we have a lot of good feedback, you know, from all over the world, people that do um, the technique. And however, you know, our technique, for me, as like I'm born in Berlin, that's the equivalent of New York. For me, things need to be quick and effective and need to be done with. And so, and that's sort of many of my treatment approaches are reflecting that. What are the chances that I could get you to walk us through all the points? Yeah, so, <clears throat> you see the, the first line. So, first of all, on the cranium, it's the sutures that have a very high level of autonomic innovation. So, it's the uh, entrance suture here. And so, we do that by putting one hand in front of the other and with the fingertip being lined up in a straight line. That's the first point, and the tapping is always in a waltz rhythm, one, two, three, one, two, three, like a Strauss waltz, light and uplifting, because we're always antidoting trauma with that. And blues rhythm doesn't belong here. It uh, deepens the trauma. So the next one is the upper half of the orbit here that really has in it a whole what we call homunculus, a whole representation of everybody's system. And so we're curling our fingertips around here and tapping that again with the wall with them. And then the next one is the zygomatic arch at this bone here. And we've been tapping down onto it. That is the beginning of the gallbladder meridian, which really is um, Gallbladder stands not just for the gallbladder, but for all of the detox function of the liver are turned on that way. You know, so we're tapping on here. And it's trapped traumatic experience leads later in life to the retention of toxins. There is a relationship between the toxic patient and the patient who hasn't done their psychological homework. The more you clean up the system psychologically, the more you clean it up. The, you facilitate the removal of toxins from your body. And so this is the, the goal that I'm reading is the bridge between those two worlds. And the next one is a bit more difficult to show. That's the uh, collinear nuclei in anatomy. So there is the, you know, where the soft part of the neck and the bone meet, that's the inferior line. One can if you go up about two inches, there's an indentation in the bone that's highly, highly autonomically innovated. And tapping that, that has points, an actual points in it that belong uh, to the bladder meridian and gallbladder meridian. But it is basically the area more showed that that opens up the pons. Yeah, the pons and the brain stem is the link between the conscious part of our brain and the um, the spinal cord and all the unconscious stuff that goes on in the body. Or well, one could say it's the link between your mind and the body. Yeah, and that's this. Very, very important. And for reasons that I understand, that all of you know, Craig and all the other inventors of tapping techniques forgot this point and it's to me the most important. Yeah. The next one is the vertical line underneath the eyes and acupuncture that roughly the stomach meridian now that looks like this. We'll be lining up the fingers in a straight line and tapping downwards. And the fingertips are important as I recall because the acupuncture meridians end at those tips and you want to make sure you're addressing all the meridians, correct? Yeah, each tap, you use all five fingers. And you have, you know, on the on the thumb, you have the lung meridian, you've got the lymphatic meridian. Um, on the index finger, you've got the colon meridian. And so it's like each fingertip is loaded with a connection to the acupuncture system, but also to the autonomic nervous system. You know, so next was the stomach meridian. 
um, the stomach meridian in our work has been revealed itself as uh, being very, very strongly linked to the feeling of homelessness. Yeah, you know, that's in America very prevalent here, you know, like in, in Europe, because you lived like for 17 generations on the same house in the same land, also you don't have issues of wondering where you belong. But in America, pretty much everyone I know is uncertain about where they belong to, except maybe some people from, uh, I don't know, from Arkansas or Mississippi or so, but you know, on the West Coast, you know, that nobody I know is from here, they all moved from somewhere else. And so the issue of homelessness often comes up with the stomach meridian. And the stomach meridian, as I said before, also is linked to phobias and fears, you know, and uh, chronic anxiety is now one of the most prevalent prevalent symptoms that come in, patients come to uh, to us for. Okay, the next one is the upper teeth. Each tooth is linked to a meridian front teeth, to the kidneys, the, the canine, to the gallbladder, and so on and so forth. You know, and so by tapping the, the upper teeth, we're stimulating every organ system in the body. And then the lower teeth, same thing. And then we tap a straight line on the side of the chest. Uh, that's the spleen meridian. That's usually, um, the spleen meridian has to do with the feeling of not feeling good enough, you know, which is many of us, no matter what we've achieved in life, somewhere deep down is a feeling of not being good enough, not having done enough. So this is the typical feeling that comes up here. And then the last one is the vertical line next to the sternum. That's the kidney meridian. And the kidney meridian, you know, that has to do with fear, again, with anxiety, and has to do with family, and has to do with many other things. But fear is a predominant um, emotion there. And we have some, a couple of extra points, but this, these are the big ones that we teach our patients and that um, our practitioners need to know um, in order to quickly resolve issues as they're coming up you know, in the office. The you know, patient comes in, they cry. Um, we ask them, what is it about? They said, well, you know, just, I just lost my dog. You know, sort of, and so we do our testing, AIT testing, and shows one of the in this testing, okay, that's the meridian for abandonment and for loneliness and, and losses. And so, I mean, people, you know, tap the small intestine, which is here on the hand. We don't need to do it. You know, when we do this tapping, I also tap the small intestine on the finger, so we can just do the whole tapping sequence. And while the patient is thinking of the dog and thinking of the closeness that they has and the pain they're feeling right now, and um, after a few rounds of tapping, tap and tone, generally the, the grief will flip into the joy that they had these beautiful years with their dog um, and the gratefulness of having had that experience of love and closeness to another being. So um, the, the tapping point can be used as a standard, you know, for whatever problem you have, you're tapping through all the points or like if you are with the um, advanced practitioner, they can test out which points specifically are testing for this particular issue. That's what Callahan was doing. It was very, very quick within seconds. You could establish like a number code of you tap here first and then here and then here. That's it. And he was very, very brilliant at that. It was almost divinely guided towards the end of his life at that. But for us normal mortals, we do the entire tapping sequence on the issue that is present. Well, um, thank you so much for walking us through that. Like you, I have a penchant for things that are easy, fast, and can totally transform your life, you know, and I think this is one of them. So I've, I've been using it for years. Is there anyone, if there's, and there might be people out there listening and saying, well, I don't know if I can do it, if I'm safe to do it. Is there, are there any contraindications at all to tapping into me? Uh, no. No, they are not. Yeah. So it's kind of, I mean, if you, 
the only technique in medicine that I know that has no contact. Yeah. So beautiful. Even, even if a patient is schizophrenic and in the middle of a, a dangerous uh, excursion into madness, even then we've seen people slipping back out of that. Just put the, and it's possible to tap on another person in that way, someone who's not able to tap for themselves. Can you? Yeah, that comes up a lot. You know, that moms have to tap the autistic children, you know, mm-hmm. in the different scenarios and situations that they find themselves in. And we have, of course, uh, people that are in a coma or people with advanced Alzheimer's disease or other disabling illnesses where they cannot do their own tapping. And then somebody else taps the points for them. You can even own for them that uh, may not have the full effect, but it still has 80% of the effect. Wow. To just open your throat and make a sound as you're going through the points. I love it. Um, what's the current state of the experiment between the Europeans who tap at, tap willingly and the Americans who refuse? Yeah. Uh, so the, now I have to say the Europeans and generally uh, that I treat seem to have a much bigger foundational health as the average American. Uh, and to remember the at least the Germans and Swiss that I take care of in Austrian, they were not exposed to fluoridated drinking water. They had a maybe for each ten vaccine the you Americans got, they may have gotten one. Uh, and so they have a much bigger foundational health also like the um the the sources of food are uh, much closer to nature than they are here because Europe is just small and, and the transport ways are short. And so people generally, I mean, that I know they buy their food straight from the farmers where they're grown and they make sure that the farmer is not using pesticides and herbicides. So against that backdrop of having a healthier uh, population, I have to say, that the Europeans are much more responsive to the treatments that I I offer by selecting just the cap and tone, and then we have some treatments instead of giving supplements. We have a way of piggybacking the supplements on light, on a light beam, and painting the, the patient with the light. That's uh, the method that I developed. You know, this called photophoresis, where the light carries the frequencies of the medication of the vitamins into the body. And so many of my practitioners work just with light and with temp and tone and some of the other more psychological techniques with fantastic results. And and so and here in the US we have to I'm calling out also the IV therapies or the more heavy heavy handed um therapies, um the detox therapies, you know, we have to turn turn up the strength of things here quite a bit in order to get results. And this is not that the character of the people here is different. Also, it's just the basic load that people have um, requires a bit more invasive measures, if you want. Yeah. Well, this has been amazing. I'm I'm just... um... I'm sitting with all the places we've been already and there are many more we could go. But before we end, are there any things that you feel people who are struggling with complex mystery illness or chronic issues and haven't found hope or help yet? Anything else you'd like to say to them before we wrap up? The um, the issue that we are uh, exploring since COVID is the, the influence you know, on the, in the spirit world the, that there has been a darkening of influences on us, um, that we used to call spirit possession. We don't use those religious terms anymore. But there's a lot of uh, en- energies that are pulling uh, on people and that are distorting people's thinking, the invasive energies from the outside. The Wi Fi is sort of the low frequency, I know that, but there is sort of uh, the the energies of unhealed trauma in the society and unhealed this and that and then and entities you know living people that died that haven't moved on they have an influence and we find more and more that that we have to go on that level to help 
uh, people with severe chronic illness to resolve the issues. Um, I could give you like a huge number of examples of healings that happened that way under this. If you get old enough, and I dare to talk about these things, and uh, I also dare to include that in the way I practice. And so that has been a shift in the last few years that none of my old practitioners can overlook that there has been an influence of something dark uh, invading us on the outside that cannot be cured with the vitamin or intravenous infusion or acupuncture or um, the clever psychological uh, intervention. And so I really would like to open your mind to that and whether this and question can be answered on the level of established religion. Yes, it can, um, but to find true healers within each of the different religions, it's not easy. Yeah, so, and I mean, to work with prayer has become an important part of my prescriptions for patients, and that has been amazing uh, to see that. And many of my patients are not Christian, but all my patients know how to pray. So that's something we don't use. I used to avoid talking about, but sort of life and the circumstances, you know, with this insanity of the last three years that we've seen has led us to having to include other, other tools. But in general, I would say, you know, so I invite you all to come to the Sophia Health Institute. I surrounded myself with a team of competent, beautiful, physicians that know the rope on this and we take you through a number of things, you know, usually and we start on the physical level and we look at your, whether you don't, isn't it still lime barricades in your limbic system that are causing your anxiety? Well, the answer is yes. Yes, the Epstein bars there and all the other things. So we put the protocol together Usually biological proper, uh, protocols, usually we work without the use of antibiotics. We just have not found value in that. Yeah, we follow the medical literature. There's for each herbal, uh, for each um, combination of conventional uh, drugs, there's usually a simple herb that in the research did better than a combination of drugs. And so we choose the herb. And so... We do then, we clean up the nutrition, we get the patient exercise, yes, all the basics, but then we move up the levels and then as quick as possible and work on the other levels as well. Um, and that tends to be uh, the prescription for people out of chronic illness to get well again. You have to, um, the solutions on the physical level uh, with chronic illness are still very limited. And they will always be limited because if the true cause of the chronic illness is not to be found on the physical level, you have to go to the other levels and include them. And so find a practitioner or a team of physicians or connect your practitioners that cover all the levels. Don't get five people that work on level one. Get one person that works on level one and then get one person who is good and the field of energy medicine and work them there and then get another person who works on the mental level on the level of psychology or plastic homeopathy find somebody good there and then find somebody who works on a higher level who, who dares to go there and and we don't expect every physician to be able to work on all levels you know we expect um, physicians to kind of know where life has led them and what their destiny is and some people are destined to be brilliant at cracking the genome and basing the nutrition on that and other physicians are destined to work in the realm of energy medicine and that's their fulfillment and other physicians some of you are destined to work on all levels and some of you are destined to things that we don't even have words for and to find that and to find your passion in that that your passion leads you as a physician 
that the passion leads you for where the right spot is. And as a patient, um, treatment should always make sense to you and follow your intuition. Usually there is an inner voice in you somewhere that tells you what the next thing is that you need to crack. Yeah, most people come to me with a very, very clear expectation of what the next thing is that they should crack, whether finding the toxic stress and resolving that or dealing with the mold, dealing with the parasite. Most people know but have learned to not trust that in our Western so I would like to encourage you to just go in and just kind of really hear that inner voice telling you, okay, we need to now do some of this. We need to have our assets adjusted. Or when, whatever the the next movement is, and healing always goes in sequence. Right. You know, there's a proper sequence to do this next thing next, and then the next thing, rather than doing this thing first and then this thing. There is a sequence of events, and only your inner voice will tell you what that is. You know, but if you need help, Come to see us at the Sophia Health Institute. We're sort of half an hour from the Seattle airport. And um, it's the last place in the U.S. that will be green um, and beautiful. And the climate is almost, almost always mild. We don't have, we don't get snow, we don't get ice. You know, it's always comfortable. And so it's an invitation to see you there. Perfect. Well, we'll leave it at that and we'll put all the links to those things in our show notes. Thank you again, Dietrich. This has been such a gift. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Healing Grove podcast. If you liked it, please be sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to deepen your experience further, consider grabbing a copy of the Healing Grove playbook. With journal prompts for this podcast and 41 others, it's the perfect place to record your learnings, keep track of the tools you explore, and reflect on your own experience. Finally, it's important to mention that even though I am a doctor, nothing you hear on this podcast, whether from myself or my guests, constitutes medical advice. Any intervention you try should always be discussed with and supervised by a trusted member of your own healing team. Thanks for listening, and see you next time in the Healing Grove.